Good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming out today, particularly in the weather. Uh, I want to thank Elle Myers for uh, inviting me and for making this talk possible. Um, as Groover just mentioned, um, I want to thank my two former students, Groover Snell, who did the introduction, and Katie Cesara, who was one of uh, four students that um, were research assistants for me in the process of doing this book. Um, so um, so I, I want to start by briefly discussing um, the process of researching the transformation of Whitman College and some of the issues there and then to the big themes of, of the book. Um, for 30 of the 40 years covered in the book, from I was professor from 1985 to 2015, the end year of the book. Um, this is not my memoir um, by any means whatsoever, um, but it produces challenges, um, you know, that I have to make sure that I don't let, you know, I remembered something one way, but I quickly would find out in the archives that that really wasn't <laughs> the way it necessarily happened. Um, and so I had to constantly check myself. Um, fortunately, there are many records that I could draw from, and I was given access to all the college records, even things that are restricted to everybody else. So I, I feel like, you know, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. at the Kennedy Library um, getting special access um, and stuff. Um, I think it's quite on par. Um, and uh, papers of the presidents, board papers, papers of deans, um, publications of the college, faculty um, minutes, and a variety of things. But with all of that, there were problems. Um, there are gaps in those records. Whitman does not have a policy on collecting its records. So there's nothing to stop a president or somebody else from not handing over their records or destroying their records or other things that may be in the news these days. Um, a lot of these records, as um, Katie can attest to, um, having worked um, in the Whitman College archives while she was a student, um, many of the records of Whitman College are unprocessed. Um, so there's no finder's guide. So you just got to plow in, and you don't know if there's going to be something worthwhile or if it's all going to be, you know, um, just lunch orders or what have you. Um, so, uh, so you. So you just got to go through everything um, and, and, and see, because no, we just haven't processed all of them. So that's one solution to it. Um, another was interviews. I conducted a number of interviews with, uh, with the former presidents, um, all of them, um, with, uh, with many other administrators, with uh, some faculty, students, um, board members, and stuff. So, um, so that, was, that helped fill gaps and, or, or add to the record. I was very fortunate that uh, I got a, one enormous donation of records to the archives um, from John Stanton, um, who was a board member from, 2000, uh, from 1993 to 2015, a graduate of Whitman 1977, um, and more significantly, owner of the Seattle Mariners currently. Um, and so he gave me, he, and he kept everything, everything. Um, and it also made me a hero to his wife that I was taking this <laughs> massive collection out of the closets and stuff. So, um, so that was a bonus for me. Um, and, uh, and then Tracy Anderson, who was a counselor at the college, stopped me on the sidewalk on Boyer one day and said, you're going to work on this? And she said, I said, yes. And she said, you know, I briefly did a little project on the history of the counseling center. Uh, would you be interested in those records? And the next day in my mailbox in Maxie Hall was this thick envelope with a variety of things that, that proved quite, quite useful. So... Um, Rogers Miles, I'm sure many of you might know him. Um, he has every email that ever existed at Whitman College from the day he, he still has them. He has more, he has more different computers to do different, he's got, you know, floppy disks and, I mean, so 
when I needed to get some information, you know, on a certain, Rogers would have, the, if there was an email exchange on it. Um, so he, he generously gave me a few things. Um, so the point is I had to get as many perspectives to counter mine um, and to build off of and to, and to tell the story. And so, um, and I'm happy to take questions on that or any other topics at the end. So why do I call it the transformation of Whitman College? Um, besides the fact that I published a book um, a year after on Franklin Delano Roosevelt and called it the transformation of American foreign policy, so clearly I was on to something um, in my head. Um, and I call it at the end the most dynamic period in the college's history, so why? Well, to start to answer that, I think we, it's helpful to ask what aspects of Whitman's history set it apart in this period from what else was going on in the Pacific Northwest um, in terms of higher education and then nationally as well, but more to the Pacific Northwest and its own history. Um, and so when Robert Allen Scottheim arrived July 1st, 1975, um, to take up the presidency of Whitman College, um, the direction of the college did not follow what happened basically in the rest of the Pacific Northwest. Whitman did not become a mini university like Willamette, PLU, UPS. It did not become a, a vocational school like George Fox or some, some other schools as well. Um, Scott Heim twice uttered the phrase, whatever we're doing, it's not to become Reed. Um, so it wasn't the goal wasn't to replicate Reed. Um, that was in response to being criticized for doing that. Um, and uh, um, so instead, Scott Heim's goal for transforming Whitman, and he intended to transform Whitman, was by committing it, recommitting Whitman to its most traditional aspects, residential liberal arts college not to become a mini university, not to take on professional programs, not to um, do these other things that many others were doing in efforts to meet the crisis of the mid-1970s, which I'll talk about um, just a bit more um, in a second. And the, the, the centerpiece of that for Robert Allen Scottheim was the professionalization of the faculty, the bringing of the teacher-scholar model to Whitman, um, right, and, and moving toward a faculty that was both committed to the teaching, which it historically had been, but also would become scholars as well as a way to support that primary mission of being teachers at a residential liberal arts college, that you had to commit to both. From 1970 to 19. 75, just to take a snapshot, over 150 liberal arts colleges or small religious schools closed in the United States. Um, it was a crisis period for, for the smaller schools. The post-World War II emphasis on higher education was into state universities, big state universities. Um, right, so the explosion of the state university systems, the creation of um, outside of New York and California where they already existed in, in in, in some forms, the community colleges, right? Our community colleges, a product of that time period and that commitment. Um, right? so, so that's where the federal monies were going. That's where, um, and, and so liberal arts colleges were seen as becoming um, anachronistic. Um, that time was passing them by. Whitman certainly was struggling when Scott Heim arrived Whitman was accepting 95% of all applicants. Um, so uh, now, we explained that at the time, royal we here, I wasn't here, um, in 1975, as well as students are self-selecting. You know, the ones that wouldn't get in aren't, aren't you know, uh, applying. So, um, so, you know, we're getting, it, so it's okay. The problem with that was that we were graduating less than 50% of them after four years. So um, it wasn't, you know, another way of putting it was for every 300 we were bringing in, we were only graduating 200 that same, um, you, you know, four, you know so, so it was a constant um, struggle. 
Um, so, so there are a variety of other ways that the liberal arts colleges. Um, so for Scott I'm, you had to commit to both teacher and scholar if you were going to solve this. Women had to do something that hadn't done in the past, be growth oriented, aspirational. Um, it, had to, it had to add to its curriculum, Scott Heim believed, um, and break from a curriculum that was directly the same in terms of the composition of the departments and stuff as it had been in the 1920s. Um, it had to increase the size of the student body. Many of you may know that in the early 1970s came the end of in local parentis. Um, right? And that changed everything in terms of uh, student services and on campus um, living. So, with the end of in local parentis, the end of house, house mo mothers um, and things like that, there was chaos in the dormitories. There was no structure, there was no. Um, and uh, so, that was a mess. Um, same time, students wanted more freedom, so they loved it, right? Um, you know, I mean, here's a perfect example. The college generously announced that it was eliminating um, visitation hours. Um, the ASWAC had already voted to get rid of them, and the students were ignoring them by that point anyway. And when the deans would give out their demerits and fines, the students weren't paying them. Um, so, you know, it was... You know, they were trying to catch up to the, what was going on in many ways. Um, so they wanted more freedom, but at the same time, they wanted more from the school. Right? And parents wanted more from the school. Other schools, particularly state schools, had things like health centers, had things like counselors, had things like residential life programs, career centers. Whitman didn't have any of those. Um, so... You had, to, well, that costs money, that takes um, planning. Um, so this was another area of transformation in student services. Athletics. One of the first things Robert Allen Scottheim does when he becomes president in 1977 is he eliminates the football team. Uh, quite a controversial move um, at Whitman. But he's trying to free up resources because there's two growing demands. One is Title IX has been implemented and, right, and you have to start having varsity women's sports. And at the same time, students want to create new sports. So there are students who are asking, can't we make soccer a varsity um, sport or th things like that? Or they want more recreational sports. That is what becomes the outing program um, and things like that. So, um, so that's another area of dramatic transformation that comes over time. Now, Jim Moore, who's a graduate of Whitman from the class of 1966, is writing a two-volume history of athletics at Whitman. Um, so, um, and he's, volume one is, should be done by the end of this year um, and, and published. Um, and he talks about the current time period of Whitman athletics um, since the since around 2000, 2005, as the renaissance of Whitman Athletics. And the first time he gave a talk, I watched as many Whitman alums who were also board members jerk back and react like, because <laughs> if there's a renaissance, there had to be some period when Whitman was really good at athletics and nobody could remember that. And the reason was because it was in the early 1930s um, and, uh, that he was talking about. So... Um, but there has been, indeed, a renaissance um, in, in Whitman Athletics. Um, another great transformation to the college, and I'll come back to this more, is the physical plant. Um, changed dramatically in this time period, the most dramatic change um, to, to the college. Um, diversity. Whitman College in 1975 was a white, middle-class, northwestern student body. Um, that was 96% of the student body could roughly be defined that way. Um, well, it's become much more diverse in terms of um, the composition of the student body, the geographical location, the economic, um, socioeconomic factors. Um, 
the faculty has become more diverse, the curriculum has become more diverse um, in this time period. Um, financially, the college is more secure by the end of the period of time than it had ever been um, in its history, and that allowed it to, um, to aspire and to, and to grow. Um, so when I say transformation, these are the areas that I'm talking about. These are the type of features that, that I, I address in the book. Um, so from 1975 to 2015, to put it another way, um, Whitman went from being Stephen B.L. Penrose's college, the college Stephen B.L. Penrose created in his 40 years as president from 1896 to 1936, a college that if he walked on the campus in 1975, the only thing he wouldn't have recognized was co-ed dorms. Everything else, curricularly, et cetera, was the same. Um, there, there was a, a, new, a new dormitory, um, Douglas Hall, um, but you know, hardly, hardly a ripple um, along those lines. Um, by 2015, Whitman was Scottheim's college, not Penrose's college anymore. It reflected the, 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 the process that Robert Allen Scottheim put in place in 1975. It still had crucial aspects of Penrose's foundations and goals. Penrose wanted the college to be a liberal arts college in the New England tradition, modeled off of his alma mater, Williams, became that. He wanted it to be a national college. It did not become that. He wanted it to be a financially sound college. Penrose certainly didn't succeed there. Um, that was his greatest failing. Um, but Scottheim's initiatives overlaid on Penrose's foundation with the recommitment to the traditional aspects of residential liberal arts became the, excuse me, the dominant influences um, at Whitman and it, is the college that we now have. Well, for all this to happen, many difficult and sometimes di di divisive um, but decisive decisions have noted too, the teacher-scholar model and the dropping of football. Why was the teacher-scholar model controversial? Um, well, um, its critics, and the leading critics of this were the faculty themselves, um, was that it was a threat to teaching, right? That it was a threat to become a mini university and that Whitman could not compete with the universities. It did not have the resources to do that. Um, Tommy Howells wrote a blistering commentary in 1976 about how Whitman did not have the resources. Um, other faculty leaders you know, made similar um, arguments. that So it was impossible to compete. It was setting Whitman on a road to failure was their argument um, and it would undercut um, what it was best at which was teaching. There was another thread to that which is we're doing fine. Our students graduate, well the ones that stay for four years if you take out that high attrition rate um, you know of literally 15 percent of students were leaving um, in their first year and the, big, the second big exodus was junior year. They'd come for two years and then off to the University of Washington or other places. Um, particularly if you're going to do chemistry or something like that, you know, um, off to the University of Washington um, they went, um, which has always been Whitman's biggest com competition actually for students. Um, and, uh, you know, so, but they're, they're doing fine and, you know, they're happy, so why, you know, why are we, why are we upsetting this? Scott Iam had a, you know, strategic plan process that he linked to um, our, the 10-year accreditation report in 1978. President of Reed um, was, the, was the chair of this. And he came in and he wrote us a report that basically said, abandon these aspirations. Abandon um, this desire to, to, to be a national college. Be happy being what you are, you know. So I mean, there was, there was all sorts of, and I could go on and on, as I do in the book, um, <laughs> about this. Um, and, uh, but Scott Iam was determined that no, 
Um, there's no way that Whitman can turn the corner and meet this crisis of admissions and of, and of its resources without elevating itself, right? without becoming aspirational, and that would be done through professionalization. It would also be done through the professionalization of student services, right? creating student services, creating um, residential life programs, creating a health center, and all the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, football was interesting, um, and Anitra Bright is sitting right in front of me, and I quote her husband in the book, um, when I was here interviewing in 1985, um, and still it's not a memoir, but um, that I asked, you know, so Whitman doesn't have um, football, you know, can you tell me about that? We were at dinner at the old homestead on Isaacs, um, and, uh, and and he gave me an answer, which turned out to be very interesting. Um, so when you get into the records about this, and the students are protesting about the elimination of football, um, what Fred said to me was, more students showed up on that Wednesday in Memorial to protest the elimination of football than ever went to, down to watch a football game, um, right? Um, the, the students didn't care a lick about it. In fact, that's what they were protesting, that there wasn't their input. They weren't consulted, they said, about it. They weren't all that upset about football one way or the other. Um, and uh, in fact, the, 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 now it's the W Club, but back then the, fun, you know, the, the Booster Club was called the 176 Club after our attendance at one particular game in the 1960s. Um, you know. um, so, um, so that was the, you know, but for Scott Heim, he had to find money. He had to create a women's basketball team. He had to create, you know, women's track. There was women, there was, you know, there was a men's track team, but there wasn't a women's track team. He had to meet student demands for soccer, and actually women's soccer came on before men's soccer because of Title IX and, and things. So, right, he had to find, and the board wasn't going to just give him money. Um, Whitman had a strict no debt policy, so he couldn't borrow money, so you had to find resources somehow, and so it was shifting them around um, from a program that um, was not in anybody's foreseeable future going to hit that renaissance moment, the Whitman football team. Um, on the other hand, we're undefeated since 1977. So, um, He launched a campaign for Whitman, a $50 million campaign. The goal there was to get over the quote-unquote, Scott Hines' words, depression mentality, that when he arrived, Whitman was still operating literally on the dictates of the 1930s under policies adopted during the Great Depression to meet the debt that Penrose had put the college in. Um, and so one of those policies was no external debt anymore. Um, Don Sherwood once said that college presidents are like ministers. They come in, they get the congregation all excited to build a new church, and then they leave before the thing is finished, right? And they leave you with the debt, um, right? So we're not, get, you know, I don't want to hear any aspirational. When Scott Ein did this, Sherwood began a study which he called 50 Years of Debt-Free Financing at Whitman College. It was a shot across the bow. Young man, no, 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 young man. We, we don't do these things here. Um, he only wrote the first chapter, but the point was made, um, right? Um, but fortunately for Scott Heim, he had Baker Ferguson on his side, right, who wanted the college to aspire, that knew something had to change. And so Baker became, right, the president of the bank, became the buffer. I'll handle Don. You don't screw up, young man, <laughs> was basically the, the deal. Um, and uh, so he launched, because the only way he could do, make these changes was to find new monies. Whitman had just gone through two failed capital campaigns. Its history of capital campaigns were failure, not success. Nobody in the Pacific Northwest, in any institution, had ever raised $50 million in a campaign um, at this time. So this was beyond anything that the Pacific Northwest. You gotta remember, this is pre, you know, tech boom, pre, you know, this is when, you know, Boeing and the, and the extractive industries dominated you know, farming, timber, mining, et cetera. So, um, um, 
so that was another thing along with that aspiration and growth was having the ability to admit mistakes were made. Um, so after Scott I'm, the college brought in David Maxwell, who ended up resigning after four years. Um, right. And at the same time, as his presidency was imploding, the college had launched what was called the Student Life Enhancement Program, SLEP. And it was failing. Um, and so you could either just keep going and dig in, right, or you could admit it. And finally, the college admitted it, um, right? And uh, um, David Maxwell had established a curricular review committee that um, didn't succeed, um, got bogged down, um, divisive. Um, the only thing that came out of it um, was taking the existing first year program from three tracks of study into a single track of study. Every other initiative that it tried um, was not adopted. Um, the SLEP campaign was poorly conceived. Um, it, was, it was not, they hadn't done the proper studying. They didn't know where the money was going to come from. Um, didn't even own some of the property that they were announcing that they were going to build a new dining hall on, um, but hadn't secured that property yet. Um, so that went well when, when, uh, um, when that appeared in the Union Bulletin, that fact. Um, um, local people thought, well, that's really quite arrogant, isn't it? Um, and, uh, um, or as one former trustee put it, because one of the leading people in that neighborhood was Kate Brocker, the, the astronomy part. He said, oh yeah, SLEP, the, the thing that the astronomy department single-handedly destroyed, right? Um, and there was only one astronomer then, Kate Brocker. Um, and, uh, but she led the neighborhood charge against this. Um, so the college was suffering again after Scottheim from lack of leadership, from a failing cam capital campaign. It was plunged back into a budget crisis, back into debt in its annual budget, which it hadn't had. Um, not that it was taking on debt, it just, you know, it was just part of the operational budget because the admissions, again, was falling behind. Um, and so the college had to make, and they did, they made a very decisive decision um, to, for the president to resign um, and then very quietly announced that SLEP was no more. When they hired Tom Cronin, he was promised, you'll never hear it, don't worry about it, you know, that's, that's not going to be um, a millstone around your neck. Um, so, um, instead, what the college did at that critical moment of 1993 was it began a process which ultimately called Plan 400 to expand the student body. Um, right? So in the face of this failure, aspiration returned. Um, a new group of young trustees, John Stanton, Robert Ball, and some others came on board, joining Jerry Hillis and others um, who wanted right, to move. Um, and so financial aid was rethought, merit scholarships came in, other things to allow for growth. Um, the profile of the student body began to change. Um, it was conscious that the, that the college was going to recruit outside very aggressively the Northwest, particularly in California. Um, and so what had been two years of deficit, 1991 to 1993, and budget crisis, became by 1995 budget surpluses and growth. Um, very dramatic turnaround um, in Tom Cronin's first two years as president, driven by this Plan 400 and this much more conscious approach. Um, you know, I was saying to Groover earlier, it's, you know, it, Sisyphus is a, had to have been an admissions officer at a small liberal arts college at some point because, you know, that's, it's just always a constant, it's never, it's never a resolved um, problem, you know, 
the two central parts, recruiting students and recruiting money, you know, they're just ongoing um, issues. Um, under Cronin, who's president from 93 to 2005, two historic decisions were made. One was to expand the size of the board. Whitman had only nine board members, um, right, and, and many people treated that as even more, um, had to be kept more than the Supreme Court had to be kept at nine. The Supreme Court does not have to be kept at nine, for, for, just for the record. Um, that's not a constitutional um, requirement. Um, and to allow the college to take on debt. Um, these were critical structural changes to the college um, that went against its history, that went against its tradition, that went against Don Sherwood, that went against who had passed away, um, and went against his 1976 history and all of its warnings. Um, and so as I mentioned, the physical plant was transformed. Um, Hunter Conservatory, old music was turned into Hunter Conservatory. The library was renovated. Um, Sherwood Center was renovated. The Science Building got a new wing. Harper Joy Theater was renovated. The Reed Center was constructed. The Fout Center for the Arts was constructed. The Ferguson Center, uh, the um, recreational and, and uh, center was, was created. Um, public art on campus, trees um, on, Cronin would, was planting um, hundreds of trees annually. Janice Abraham, the treasurer, when Tom Cronin first came, told me that if she had $5 for every time she had a conversation with Tom Cronin about putting a bench on the Whitman campus, she would have retired long ago. Um, <laughs> so any bench you see, Tom Cronin put it there. He wanted it. Um, why is there a volleyball court in front of the science building? Um, and why did we used to, I, I know it's changed now, but you used to have to go to the library circulation desk to check out the volleyball, right? Which is normal, right? I mean, that's usually how it works. Um, it's because Tom Cronin said, kids from California aren't gonna wanna come here if they don't see outdoor volleyball courts, right? So, so we put one, and what's the most conspicuous spot? Ankeny Field, so we put it right next to Ankeny, and, and um, so, but you know, right next to Styx, the, the Deborah Butterfield um, that he commissioned um, and stuff. So, he just transformed the physical plant while building on the other Scott Heim initiatives. Um, another tough time, of course, was the financial crisis of 2008. Um, and Whitman got through it much better than any other school in the Pacific Northwest um, and much better than most schools in the, in the country through, um, through a very creative way of using the endowment and changing the, changing the endowment use, usage, um, which I'm sure you want me to go into in detail because it's, you know, fascinating stuff. Um, it's just, you know, keep you up. You'll, you'll be up all night thinking about it if I go into it, so I don't want to cost you because um, I'm already putting you to sleep now. And, um, so, but it was a significant thing. But at the same time, and this is the new lesson, just like in the early 1990s, at the same time, Whitman had been planning for another capital campaign, and now is the time campaign. And when did it launch it? In 2008, right at the bottom of this drop, right? Now, John Stanton, who was the chair of the campaign, and as I mentioned, board member, um, did two things at the time. One is he wrote a memo to the trustees, and he said, well, you know, in any eight-year period, and that was the projected period of the campaign, there's going to be a year and a half of economic downturn. We're just getting it at the beginning, so it's all up from here, folks. Um, but to put something behind that, they had a meeting up at the college at the Johnston Wilderness Center, um, and, and Stanton said, my $15 million are still on the table. I'm not taking them off. And that was 10% of the goal of 150 million. He said, I'm not walking away from this, um, and I expect you all to stay with me too. Um, one trustee told him on the drive back that, who runs an irrigation, big irrigation company in Southern California, he said, John, I look out there at all those beautiful pipes, and I count the same number every day, um, but all right. 
my money's still in too, and we'll figure it out. Um, so, but that's leadership, right? And that, so these crucial type of decisions. So I could go on, but let me wrap up and then take questions. Um, so what are some of the lessons I took from this? Um, or what have I told the new president of Whitman College that she should know from this? Um, which she was thrilled. She just she couldn't wait to be told what to do. Um, stay true to the fundamentals of being a residential liberal arts college. That is crucial to the success. The most dynamic period, the period of greatest change, was done because the college doubled down on that aspect. Um, right? Stayed the most conservative, in many ways, institution in the Pacific Northwest, as all the others, Whitworth, over to the coast, um, were doing a variety of other things. Why is that cr crucial? Because it creates a community of scholars, right? a community of people committed to certain things and values. Each period of crisis, the mid-1970s, the early 1990s, 2007, 2009, the college emerged stronger due to leadership, decisive decision-making, and the aspirational visions that kept teaching at the students at the forefront and the scholar teacher-scholar model as the best way to meet that commitment to teaching students in a residential liberal arts setting. Strong majors have always been a feature of Whitman. And they've been key to Whitman. Now, that doesn't mean staying with just traditional subject matters. It doesn't mean that the majors can't be interdisciplinary. Probably you could make an argument that the most successful major currently at Whitman College is environmental studies. But it's got very many different components, environmental studies, you know, chemistry, environmental studies, politics, environmental studies, history, etc. But you take them all together, and they're all interdisciplinary, um, now there's biology, that, you know, biology, if physics ruled the 1950s, 1960s in the sciences, biology rules today. Um, and 50% of all incoming Whitman students take biology and chemistry their first semester um, before, you know, so biology majors and the variations, BBMB and things like that, um, is, is within a single major is the dominant um, force today, but strong majors. But that doesn't mean you can't innovate. That doesn't mean not to, not to adopt interdisciplinary. Um, it just means that um, that has been a constant strength. The through line here then has been, from 1975 forward, is to be academically aspirational and to provide the support for that, both in terms of teacher-scholar model and student services um, in support of that. And then one final thing, people, you know, that have, you know, I've given this talk in different places to Whitman alumni, and they're like, but you know, there just seems to be so much discord on campus, and so what I want to say is misalignment, to use a word that um, certain trustees like to use um, when wagging their finger at the faculty, I'll say. Um, is the norm on a college campus. It's not, you know, find me the college campus that the norm is all f forces are all in alignment and think, you know, every decision is just, you know, that would be a very unhealthy college campus, I think, in many, many ways. Now, you can obviously have discord that's destructive and stuff. I'm not saying you can't, um, but don't worry about that there's discord and misalignment. It's something that people worry a whole lot too much about and not use it for what values it can bring in terms of bringing forth new ideas and creativity and, uh, and finding ways forward. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Um, and uh, so... Oh great, I'm on camera drinking. <laughs> this, is, this is fabulous. Yes, ma'am. My sister taught for many years at St. Olaf in Minnesota. Uh -huh. And when she was going through orientation, somebody asked, who is the top competition of St. Olaf? And she 
And they said it was Holocaust. Well, uh, we like that. Um, so um, <laughs> we like that. And uh, we have some faculty that are St. Olaf grads, um, and we have some of their children who are St. Olaf grads. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, th but that's what Scott I wanted. That's the, that, that was the group of schools he wanted to be in, right? The Carltons, um, right? The McAllisters, the St. Olaf's, the Ohio schools, you know, the Overlands and things like that. Um, you know, Scott I used to say all the time that, you know, when I talk about Williams, it's not like I want to be Williams. I just want us to aspire to be something akin to that, um, right? We have to have goals. We have to, we're not going to do it the way they do it necessarily and stuff. And, you know, Penrose, I think, really wanted to replicate it almost um, carbon copy-like. But, uh, um, but, yeah, so that's, that's exact, and that's the transformation, right? To being a national, to be in that conversation um, and not just be seen as the best in the Pacific Northwest, but to be seen amongst um, the best and able to draw nationally and internationally um, more and more. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. So, so um, the size of the student body when I arrived was 1050. Um, at 1975, um, it had dropped into the upper 900s. Um, and uh, you know, the, another way of looking at it, Whitman was so as higher education was booming. I told you that I love this stuff on the crisis of the mid 90s. Uh, 70s, excuse me. As higher education was booming, you know, state universities and stuff, Whitman contracted in the 1950s. It was actually less faculty and less students at the end of this decade where, you know, um, you know the, the, not just the GI Bill, but then all the money that the federal government was, was, was using and states were using to... Um, but of course, this was back in a time when legislators got votes by promising the baby boom parents that they were going to build fabulous state universities for their children and stuff. Um, but still, so, so it, had, it, had, it had grown a little in the 60s just by the fact that the baby boomers, first group of baby boomers hit colleges in the fall of 64. So there was just this enormously larger group, so Whitman did a little better from 64 into the early 70s. But then with the crisis of and, you know, we're also talking about nationally stagflation, right, um, you know, of the, of the early 1970s and stuff. There are a lot of national fa other factors going on um, that fortunately get discussed right there in the book. Um, and uh, so, but, it, but we began to shrink again. Um, now, to the other side of your question, women peaked prior to COVID um, over 1,500. So this conscious growth from from, uh, from where we were in 75, um, it's almost a one third, a full one third um, growth, which for Whitman is an enormous um, amount. And uh, um, it's, it's down in the, in the 1400s again. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, so it's, you know, but that's where it's sort of moving between, and, and you know, the college would like to get it back up to 1550, um, but, uh, you know, uh, but it's a struggle, particularly in the current environment we find ourselves in. Yes? Well, you got retention. Yeah, that's great. So, um, so fortunately, I don't have to rely on my memory. I brought my cheat sheet. Um, so, number of applicants in 1975, 805, of which 95% were admitted, as I said. Total number of applicants in 2015. Oh, I could, we could give away prizes, right, from the bookstore. Um, 3,790, right, so, right. Um, so retention is what you, what you asked. Um, 20, these are for 2015. Um, 93% um, retention of the 2014-2015 class, the class that came in. Um, graduation rate of 80% after four years and 88% after six years. And that's how all colleges do it. The vast majority of those with six years are actually 
nine semesters, right? Um, you know, but they don't, they can't get their actual diploma because they have an incomplete or something like that. So, so a dramatic change from the 40% um, um, then. So, so that's where we are in retention and, uh, and graduation. Yeah. Thank you. Middle class, class. Yeah. Kind of yeah. kids. Yeah. And in the beginning of the 90s, you have the advent of non need or merit based awards. I, I sat in a meeting in which Vice President said, and I quote, we're going to start going after kids with dreams in their genes. Right? I remember that. Lit, right, quote. Literally said, we're going after this. Yeah. So, how, how is your experience as a professor, but also both before? watermark and after, how do you see that changing the character of the student body as it became significantly more affluent? Yeah, so it became both more affluent and we also were giving out more financial aid. Um, so what, the, what happened over time, and it took a while for it, was we ended up, you know, it worked for it worked exactly as Rob Gardner and the proponents of Plan 400 wanted. We, uh, just the SAT scores as one measure, the GPAs from high schools, another, all of those went up. Um, we, merit scholarships were bringing in students that were, we were admitting before, but were leaving us for, for you know, better schools or better offers. Um, so, so all of that was working. Um, and. We were able to meet the financial needs of, of the students. But I think, in f I think one reading that was correct was that the number of those rural William O. Douglases was not going to sustain us. Um, you had to find. Um, but the unintended consequence, or maybe some would argue maybe not so unintended, was we actually lost our, we just stopped recruiting in, in the eastern Washington, um, small towns. There's, there's no doubt that that happened um, to our detriment. Um, except for Wawa, Wall, right? Obviously, we kept recruiting in Wawa. Wall. Um, and uh, so, um, but, you know, things change. Other schools make other decisions. Parents make other decisions and stuff. And so we started to find ourselves with a barbell. That is, we had these very wealthy kids. We had a thin middle. And then we had the need kids. And we were, that we were meeting. And that became unsustainable. Um, and so in the wake of, in the wake of 2007, 2009, new consultants, new process and stuff, and need sensitive came in. And that is we would admit blindly based on, but we would be need sensitive in terms of giving out aid, particularly in filling the bottom of the class, the last 50, 75 slots, where we'd consciously want to fill those with kids that had greens in their genes or their parents did, um, rather than more need students to try to address that problem. Um, and so, yeah, it's changed the... So there's no doubt the student body is more diverse. So let me, let me just give you these numbers, um, as is the faculty, but, um, all right. Student body, um, 2015, 21% of the student body minority and 5% international students, whereas in 1975, the two together was 5%, right? So, so that happened, and, and the monies allowed for that and allowed for programs on campus to attract certain types of students. Um, but it, it comes at a cost. Um, you know, and as I said, I think one of the costs was definitely rural kids. Um, right? you know, I mean, Whitman, Whitman didn't create satellite admissions offices in, uh, you know, in Afreda. Um, right? It created them in Bellevue in San Francisco, in Palo Alto, um, and, and places like that, right? So, yeah. 
Other questions? Yes, sir. Three questions. Oh, God. I got to get my pen out. Oh. Okay. So um, the first question, the value of the endowment, um, my numbers are not today, um, but the value of the endowment is in the 850, uh, $850 million range. Um, it had been a little higher. Um, uh, the use policy is um, a three-year rolling average, so you take the last three years, take the average from those of the value of the endowment, and then you take 5%, and that's how much you have from the endowment to spend. Um, so, um, so, and then third, endowments come restricted and unrestricted. So certain parts of the endowment are restricted. This money, and you have to therefore carve out of that 5% to that, can only be used for this, and can only be used the endowment is the biggest supporter of financial aid, but it cannot meet all the need. So the, the language is a discount rate. What's our discount rate um, between what, if we admitted a class of 400 and everybody paid the full tuition, we'd get X amount of dollars, right? But that's not what happens. We give out financial aid and stuff. So, so the discount rate had been in the 20% up to the 90s, then it went up, settled in the 30%, but now it's gone over 50%. It's being brought back to the high 40s right now. Um, and so the, a lot of the endowment, particularly unrestricted, but there are parts of the endowment that are restricted to just financial aid, go to, go to that. But parts of the endowment go to athletics. Parts of the endowment go to the Robert Allen Scottheim Chair of History um, position, right? That is fully endowed. So it's not, it comes, the money for, for that comes straight out of an endowment fund. So, so it's used in all sorts, all parts of the college get supported for it. When you take it together, endowment income is around a uh, l- little over one third of the operating budget annually. So is that, is that? Well, there's a, uh, I mean, technically on campus, it's, the, it's Peter Harvey, um, but he has a, a, a board committee, there's an investment committee, um, and we have a, a also, you know, we hire um, a group, you know, a company that manages the endowment and they're, you know, they're constantly evaluating where they're invested in. But, you know, but there are parts of it, so we own a lot of farms around here, right? People have given us farms and, uh, you know, and it's, it's been a tension. Um, some people want to sell the farms, you know, because they don't, necessarily bring in the same rate of return as, but the college's position is no, they were entrusted to us um, you know, by our donors, and our donors' intent was they stay as farms, um, and so we have to honor that um, commitment. So, uh, you know, so, so, the, so there's a farm committee, so there, you know, that's managed differently than the other parts of the endowment and stuff. But, so we have our own committees that work with um, you know, firms that, you know, invest it on our behalf and, and stuff. So that's how it's working. We out of time? Uh, we've got to get you, give you some time to sign books. So if anyone uh, wants books, they're in the store, and uh, Dr. Smith will be right here. So thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you.